we're excited today to um, bring another webinar to you. Uh, my name is Chris Giles. I am the marketing manager of Fox Ferry Lighting Solutions. And we have been uh, putting together these webinar series on a monthly basis so that we can uh, provide you with uh, more education about uh, the products that we have, uh, the industries that we serve. Uh, today, we're talking about a little bit, some other technologies and some techniques. So uh, I'm excited to have Aaron Beckman here with us today. Um, Aaron is a new addition to the Fox Ferry team, relatively new, about uh, been on for couple couple months now and Aaron is our application specialist and so he's going to be uh, traveling around working with agencies working with dealers uh, doing demonstrations doing uh, training doing that type of stuff and I'll let him explain a little bit more about uh, his role but um, we're excited to have him because he brings a lot of experience, uh, especially from the fire industry and the investigation industry, but also uh, the drone industry. Uh, he's been flying for um, quite a few years uh, and is well-versed in using drones for public safety and uh, for investigations. And like we're gonna talk today with some different technologies as well. So with that, um, I want to introduce Aaron. Thank you and welcome today. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm Aaron Beckman and, and I come from uh, Nebraska, uh, the Midwest of, of the country. And, uh, you know, I joined uh, Fox Fury, I think officially, I think we made it official uh, right around the first of, of, of January. But, you know, I've been been with Fox Ferry and, and been using Fox Ferry a little over, uh, I'm going to say probably 18 months to two years now. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things that, you know, it's funny because Antonio and I, we always talk about this, that our paths crossed uh, during a scene that I was working on when he was when he was around a couple of guys that I always crutched on uh, on on when I needed some some advice when when we were uh, when I was uh, flying a scene that I needed some lighting and he just happened to be standing next to the guy that I made a phone call to so and the rest is history so nice. I have a real strong background in the fire in the fire service. Uh, I have a real strong background in the in the photography uh, uh, background with the uh, you know uh, photographing scenes, photographing fire scenes, accident scenes, uh, and obviously I have a real strong background in the drone and in, in the in the drone industry. So awesome. Well, we're psyched to have you with us. And, um, you know, personally, I look forward to learning from you. And uh, I think uh, it'll be a, a good journey. So, yeah. uh, well, before we start up, I uh, just want to do a little bit of the housekeeping. Uh, this uh, webinar is going to be, we are recording it, uh, recording now. Uh, we're also, as I can see the uh, indicator at the top, we are live on Facebook right now as well. So you can go over to Facebook and watch this if that's easier either way uh it is being recorded so if you uh have to duck out or you uh and you can't watch all of it or you want to share it with any of your um co-workers or friends or anything um, please feel free to do that uh, the other thing is uh we do want you to ask questions um we want to hear from you we want to know what you're thinking or want to learn so down in the bottom there's a q a uh section uh, post your questions in that area, and then we will hold those to the end, and then we'll um, feel those questions as we uh, get towards the end. So uh, let's see, anything else? Um, I think that's it. I think we can get started. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and show our presentation. All right. All righty. So formalities, we, uh, we introduced Aaron Beckman. And then Aaron, I'm going to just kind of let you uh, go from here. And uh, I'll kind of hop in with some uh, different thoughts and points, but uh, I'll let you take it from here. Okay. You know, today we're going to talk about lighting uh, for photography. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things uh, that we're constantly working in on, on scenes is working in tight spaces. And uh, you're going to see some examples on that today. It doesn't matter if you're 
if you're trying to collect evidence or taking photos and evidence uh, or, you know, working in, in, in tight spaces. Um, we're going to show off uh, how uh, the Fox Ferry really helps working uh, in, in, the, in the scene uh, format as far as lights for traffic and reconstruction and investigation. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit on lights for drone overwatch. Uh, we had some really good uh, training here the last couple of weeks um, with uh, LAC RTC. Um, you know, that they were using the Exolander uh, with the D100 uh, 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 light on the Evo uh, with the light and, and the drone over doing some overwatching. And then we're going to finish up with the tactical, uh, how, how these uh, Fox Fury lights uh, work on the tactical. And then from the tactical, those lights can go right, right into the investigation side of that. Great. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways to use, you know, when we're out collecting evidence, um, filming a scene or, or photog you know, doing, doing photography on a scene is continuous lighting uh, versus flash. And uh, some of us older guys that had to uh, uh, start back in the, you know, 80s and 90s and, and the early uh, 2000s, uh, I'm going to say in the film days, uh, obviously we had to learn how to uh, uh, meter our flash uh, because our flashes weren't auto back then. And uh, so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about flash photography compared to continuous light. And uh, <clears throat> the continuous light with the newer uh, cameras now uh, is it's a quicker way of doing it. And you're getting better results with... Uh, 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 with uh, color uh, consistency through your light, uh, through your photos, compared to flash photography uh, with uh, through your through your photos. So nice, yeah. And that's uh, uh, it's fun talking to Aaron because I'm one of those old timers of photography. Started in the '90s and remember working with film, working with meters, working with flash, and um, it could get complicated just trying to get um, a good exposure, good, good photo. So uh, it's a new world and we're excited about that for sure. I remember shooting a couple of times back in the, you know, when I first started doing this with, with flash and with film. And, you know, Chris, if you remember, we only had about 24 rolls or 24 uh, pictures to a roll of film. And there were some times that you would, take 24 pictures you would go get you know the 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 strips developed but you wouldn't necessarily get the the pictures developed and we would look you know on the film through a loop on a on a on a light panel and you would just look at that going oh man i'm gonna have to tell someone that we really or i really messed this one up <laughs> <laughs> no it was a bad deal i hated those conversations <laughs> well and i mean to you know not to dwell on that too much but you know i didn't work in the like investigation side but i can imagine that if you were photographing a scene and then everything got taken down and everything got processed and everything and then you got that that those photos back and you didn't capture the details that you were going to need in court or for the investigation that was probably a really really empty feeling at that point um, and that could still happen today but at least now you can look at the back of the camera and say hey i got it i didn't get it let's let's move on now yep. <laughs> yeah so we got pros and cons to both and you know with continuous light the pros is is uh what you see is what you get you know and the other you know a few other pros uh with the continuous light is uh can double as a task and an inspection light and there's a con to that too and i'll get to that con uh when we get to that and the easier exposure calculation meaning you hold up your continuous light and, and you can look on the back of your camera and it's already uh, it's already calculating that that exposure. And a lot of time your continuous light is, is waterproof. The two continuous lights that I usually use a Fox Fury is going to be the Rugo and uh, the Nomad Now. 
<clears throat> the Nomad now is usually my main go-to light when we're when I'm doing uh, fire investigation and accident investigation uh, photography. <clears throat> the cons is, you know, it does not freeze motion with slower uh, exposure. Um, and it was funny when I was talking to Chris on this con, with the newer cameras right now, um, you can shoot such high ISO that you have no noise. So with the higher ISO, you're shooting so fast anyway that you're already, uh, 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 you know, freezing that motion. So that is a con a little bit, but it's not really a con in my opinion. Um, the next con is definitely uh, a con. And that's, you know, it's always on. It could be blinding to others. Uh, other investigators or other people on the scene. And I am definitely uh, guilty of that. When I'm walking around with a nomad now, <clears throat> I have gotten myself in a habit now that I'm always pointing that thing down um, or I'm trying to shield it. Because when I first started using the nomad now as, as, as that constant light, it was no big deal for me to turn and guess what? There was someone right there, and I was constantly blinding someone with that no bad now. So over the last six to seven months or eight months of using that now, I've gotten conscious of knowing that when I'm done taking that photo, that I turn that nomad now into my belly, which I have a big belly, and I sort of shield that light now instead of blinding all my uh, all my buddies that are helping me uh, uh, do do what I need to do on that investigation part of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the last con is it's, it's harder to overpower uh, the sun for fill uh, purpose, and uh, that's definitely a con. So the flash pros. Uh, the flash will stop motion, and it will. Um, shooting handheld, you can get a sharper photo. The thing about flash on that pro that you got to remember is a lot of times when you put a flash on a camera, it will default to 1 60th of a second. So even when you put the flash on, on a lot of cameras, uh, it will default to 1 60th of a second, which is somewhat still slow, um, where if you go to continuous light, you can still get faster exposure or uh, faster shutter speed. So you got to remember that. Chris, you might have to help me on this. Um, I think a lot of your cameras and um, with the automatic flashes now, you could probably adjust the, the shutter speed on that a little bit. Uh, yeah, they're starting to change that. They're starting to, uh, ramp that up a little bit. So I think yeah. the fastest, I think the fastest you can go on that is 200th of a second, right? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, you know, you can overpower, you know, the light or the sun, which is definitely right. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can, you know, a lot of times when people are using flash inside a room, They'll angle that flash up and bounce it off the off the ceiling, uh, so you can you know you can you can get more fill from the flash into a room, and it's very portable and can mount on the hot shoe of a camera. That's a good that's a good pro, but I'm going to get back to that on a con. <clears throat> con is it requires exposure calculations when used off the camera meaning that some of these, these flashes you can pull off the camera and you can extend it with a cord or with a, with a transmitter receiver. So when the camera, you know, when you hit the shutter button, there's a transmitter on your, on your camera. It's called a flash point. And, um, and then there's a receiver on the flash. So it will tell the flash to, uh, to shoot. Um, it's not waterproof. Moisture can damage the flash, um, which it does not take very much moisture to, to ruin those contacts in that flash. Um, flash is only controlled with aperture. Aperture is what allows the, the light into your camera, and it, re it requires additional cables and transceivers to operate off the camera. The one main con that's not in that that I want to talk about is when I'm walking around a scene, 
I usually sling that camera around my shoulder and it's hanging down about my, my hip. And I have ripped off more flashes off of a hot shoe working a scene than any other time I've damaged a camera, uh, you know, shooting wildlife, shooting sports, shooting anything. I've damaged more cameras working fire scenes, working accident scenes with a flash on a hot shoe because you will snag that, that, that flash uh, on something and you'll just tear that flash right off your hot shoe. So that's the biggest con that I've ever seen with a flash on, on a, on a camera. So, yeah, we're going to show it in just a bit, but um, that's one of the things that working with uh, like the continuous light, the little Rugo, it's a much smaller uh, light, more compact. So when it's, on your body and getting bounced around, it's going to be able to handle that abuse. And, you know, those type of things, you might be uh, photographing a scene and then somebody's like, Hey, help me move this board or this, you know, something. And you got to go jump into action and do stuff. And, you know, that's the, the nature of the business is that you're, you're kind of beating up your equipment more than you would like to, for sure. Yeah. Yep. So, oh, uh, to do, there we are. Okay. The big thing with flash is you don't get uh, you don't get uh, the same uh, color with flash. These two photos were taken with flash, and they were taken back to back, bam bam. So you will see that the photo on the right, uh, well, it would be the left when you're looking at it, is it's a little greener. And then the next photo that I took with the flash uh, is a little bluer. So the color consistency with flashes is, is a little different. Uh, and so, and why that is, is because when you take photos on a, on a, on a rapid type of a sequence where you, you take a photo and it goes snap, and then you turn around and you take another photo and it goes snap, you're losing power of that flash too. So you might not get the same power output uh, and you might not get the same color uh, tones. And that's what happened here. I took the first photo, uh, we got a green tent. I took another photo, I got a blue tent. And the next photo that I took out of this, you couldn't even tell what I was taking a photo of. So you don't get a color consistency of your photos when you're taking with flash photography. So you just got to be aware of that a little bit. Nice. And I think the next slide kind of goes talks to that uh, third photo that you were taking with the exposure. Yes. So the other thing that you got to be uh, worried about when you're using flash is you have to worry about uh, overexposure. So you can see that <clears throat> we're trying to take photos with a flash. And these are old photos. Um, you have to see that we're trying to collect that evidence of what's underneath that seat. We obviously could see that we have beer cans underneath there, but I can't really tell you what, what that sack is. And uh, so it, it's, the camera is somewhat adjusting, you know, what, what is, is the red and what's the red of the beer cans, but then the white bag there, what that, what that flash photography did or what that flash did is it put so much power into it that it exposed, it overexposed, that blew it out, it blew out that white uh, bag there. And if you looked at both of those photos, it did, it did exactly that on both photos. So. Yeah, and you tend to that, uh, um, that situation happens a lot when shooting at night. Uh, here you have a very, uh, you know, uh, it was a very dark brown car, dark brown upholstery, with a, a, a bright subject and it's the trying to even all that out um and you know you probably run into this as well with arson investigation where everything is burned out black so it's the camera's trying to make that kind of a uh, an even gray and so it's going to blow out any kind of light colored uh details but as you know, it's critical to have those for investigation and for court. Um, you lose those details and that's lost evidence. Yep. So now, you know, this is the, this is, this is the newer way that we're, we're doing, you know, the, the accident investigation and stuff. Now we're using the Nomad Now where you have consistent light 
and all I'm doing, so when I shoot with consistent lighting, I have the Nomad Now in one hand, and I have a camera in the other hand. So I'm walking around the scene, I have this light on, and I'm looking like this. So I can somewhat direct where I want this light at, and I'm looking either through the back viewfinder or the live view with this camera, and I'm taking photos like that. And it works really, really good. Uh, it works good for firefighters because when we go inside burnt buildings, sometimes I'm in an SCBA uh, because the air quality is just not good enough. So with the viewfinder in the back or the, the live view, it uh, works really, really well uh, because obviously we can't put uh, the camera up to our, our uh, mask. So I can't look through it. So, but when you're looking at this, <clears throat> We have consistent lighting. We have consistent colors. Uh, everything's consistent and there's nothing blown out throughout this. If we would have shot this with a flash, most likely we probably wouldn't have got the spidering uh, of the windshield. We probably would have blown out the center of the steering wheel. Um, we probably would have blown out a little bit of the dash and there's no blown outs here. Everything is pretty equal of everything. We could see a lot of the detail. So we can zoom in. If we want to zoom in and see how that steering wheel is broke, if we want to zoom in and see how bad that dash is wrinkled, we can zoom in on that. And we, we did not lose any detail with that consistent lighting. And you probably have a little bit uh, uh, benefit of additional speed in that when you're shooting, you know, your autofocus isn't hunting back and forth. Uh, you know, you can quickly use that same light that you're shooting with to assess what you're shooting so that you can kind of yes. go through the process a little bit faster. Yes, yes, yep. So now it looks like uh, we're moving on to a little bit of uh, arson investigation, which you do a lot of. This particular one wasn't arson, but this was a fire that, you know, we obviously had to uh, look at. So again, it's just a Nomad Now light. Uh, all we did was we just used the Nomad light just to walk around and just take some photos of, of some stuff. So the thing that you gotta remember is, you know, with a flash, uh, you know, with flash photography, you can't get underneath some of that stuff. So you just gotta remember that you have to get underneath some of that stuff. And it's very, very difficult to get underneath some of that stuff when you have a big, uh, you know, flash on top of, on top of that camera. So, um, you know, you just, it's very easy to walk around with that Nomad now and point it around and just take some photos. So. And like on the image on the right, it looks like there's uh, standing water from uh, probably the, you know, after the fire. So if you need to, you could throw that now in the water to, con you know, light up the back of that and not worry about it, you know, failing. So you yep. have that durability aspect there. Yep. And it's just, you know, and, it's just uh, very, moving in a little bit closer on stuff, details. Yep. It's just very simple to get into air, you know, tight areas so you could see detailed stuff with a constant light. So, uh, you know, with flash photography, you know, at night, you couldn't do that because you don't have constant light where you can use your, your camera to focus on stuff. If you were using a flash, um, you would have to have a secondary light to be, uh, to be pointing on the subject that you're trying to focus on. And then, then that flash would just, you know, it would flash, and then most likely you probably would have blown out some of this stuff. Where with constant light, you could sit there, you could zoom on it because you have a nice constant light on it, and then you could take a photo of it. The thing with constant light also is I could sit there and I can move it around. So if you could see the shadows on the back of your camera when you're looking at your viewfinder or you're looking at your live view and you could see some shadows you can move that constant light around to try to eliminate some of those shadows too. So, yeah, that's going to be good on uh, smaller things for creating definition to show there's texture or uh, something like that. Yep. Yep. Ah. 
So this is a uh, this is a photo of you, correct? That's a photo of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell us what uh, what where you are and what you got going on in this one. So I'm underneath a school uh, in in. Uh, and we're roughly about 200, uh, 250 feet underneath the school in confined space. And uh, we have no light underneath there. Um, and this is a good example of, you know, Fox Ferry lighting's just not for public safety. You know, we could use it on the industrial side of, of stuff too. And uh, so, you know, we had to drag all of our lead down there. We had to do, you know, uh, drag all of our lead down there. We had to get some of our tooling down there and it just wasn't enough light down there for us. So I happen to have a Nomad Now in the back of my, uh, back of my truck. And, uh, we took that Nomad Now, we put it on high and we, we, uh, used the magnetic base to put it on the pipe that I was welding in. And we just were just bouncing that light off the top of the top of the metal, uh, ceiling that was, that was over us. So and then it lasted, you know, lasted two and a half, three hours while we were down there. Nice. A little bit more powerful than that small DeWalt uh, handheld yeah. in the bottom. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just a little bit. So let's um, so let's go get back outside and look at um, scene lighting uh, kind of on a larger scale and talking about how you're using the larger scene lights for investigations, both like accident or fire, arson, that type of stuff. Uh, we're using multiple lights. Yeah, you know, so these two, these two pictures are really good examples of, hey, we need some lighting put up real quick because we're doing some training. And uh, the light, you know, the photo on the left, all we were doing is we, were, we started at the light and then it got dark on us. And we were just working on some uh, water shuttling training. And uh, we just needed some extra light over there. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of lighting over there. Usually what we would do is we'd bring a fire truck over, start up with a couple of generators, and we'd bring out some corded you know, lights. Uh, I happen to have a couple of, uh, we had three uh, Nomad 360s. We'd pop those uh, three Nomad 360s up. And uh, this gave us uh, lighting to uh, complete our training that night. And it worked out great. So uh, the thing about <clears throat> the Nomad 360s that a lot of people need to re uh, remember is those lightings, that, you know, that light goes up eight foot. So it's not blinding. You know, it's not blinding. It's overshadowing uh, the scene. So when you're walking around, when we're guiding trucks in, when people are backing the trucks in, um, that light is not directly in people's eyes. So that's something just to keep in mind. Uh, the photo on the right, you know, we went down uh, to the Texas uh, to do some drone demoing down there uh, a couple months ago. And uh, we were in a really dark uh, area. Just pulled out a couple lights uh, out of the back of the Suburban. In a matter of uh, about five minutes, we had enough light to do what we needed to do for some drone demos. So the big light, uh, obviously in the center, is the transformer, and then we put a, a Nomad 360 up. So nice. So, and you mentioned something I wanted to ask you about. Is on the left photo you mentioned uh, you could have pulled out your generator lights uh, and started those up. Give us a an idea, a realistic idea of how much time it would have taken you to set up your generator lights, set up those lights versus setting up the 360s. Well, you got a lot of manpower there, so it doesn't take, I mean, it takes a little bit, but the biggest thing is you got to run cords and stuff, you know, and then you got to maintain your generator, you got to put gas in, and right now, gas is like gold right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then the other thing is, is when you got a generator going, you got extra, uh, you know, get extra noise around a scene like that, so, you know, it's just quicker. It's cleaner, and then when it's time to clean up, all you do is you just drop your your uh, you know your nomads down. You pick up your tripods, you just throw them in your rigs uh, instead of you know wrapping up all the cords, you know, filling up your generator, checking your generator out, and uh, it's just you know it's way quicker to clean up, you know, uh, and uh, you know that's that's the thing, and it's going to be cheaper to run too. Yeah, in the long run, it's definitely going to be cheaper to run. Well, in the short run these days. So, yeah. Yep. 
Um, you know, we use the Nomad 360s that give us extra light in the back of, of scenes, you know. And this is a good example of, you know, yeah, we could take a truck back there. On these two particular scenes, um, we couldn't really get trucks back on, on these scenes uh, just for the simple fact that, you know, the alleys were were close, uh, a lot of high line wires in the back of the alleys. It was just quicker to take some lights back there and just show some lights. And uh, it's very dark in some of these areas. So you know, just pull some lights out and, and uh, just get some lights back there. So, so and it looks like, you know, you know it's uh, they've done their job on either of these two scenes. So your, your next step is investigating this scenario if it's needed. Um, so nice thing is you can use that same tool to start your investigation and these guys can go on to their next call, but you're still, you still have what you need to do. Oh, let me go back. Uh, do what you, you need to do. Yep. Yep. So, you know, yeah. you're exactly right. When we start going inside, you know, the, the, the places to do some investigation, we, you know, we usually just drop that light down a little bit. Uh, close the tripod down just a little bit and just go in and set the tripod up where we illuminate the rooms and then we use the nomad now to start taking photos nice and then uh, we move inside this is a scenario where you had a, a fire inside a it looks like a warehouse or a facility uh, it's already been put out and now you guys are uh, doing some uh, investigation on there Yep, just uh, looking for hot spots, stuff like that. It's one of those things that whenever we have fire, we always uh, uh, shut the power down. Um, when we shut the power down, we have no lighting. It's just quicker to grab us some lights, go in there, put the lights up, check for uh, hot spots, and then you know you just take the lights down and, and walk out instead of pulling all those cords, generators, and stuff like that. And again, you've got wet environments on the inside. Don't have to worry about that. Um, worry about that uh, affecting the lights or shorten anything out or can handle all those conditions. Yep. Yep. And the other thing is, is, you know, between, you know, so you look at, you know, some of the, I, I call them tool, uh, tool lights. You know, uh, the thing with Foxbury lights is those lights will run for, you know, up to four hours on high power and uh, six to eight hours on low power, you know, or medium power, where, you know, some of those tool shop lights uh, that, that, you know, you can get at your hardware stores, uh, you know, you run those on high, uh, you're maybe going to get, you know, two and a half hours max on, yeah. on a battery. And then all you're doing is you're changing out batteries and you got to be charging batteries somewhere. So. Yeah. So you were well, talking about this uh, photo on the right yesterday. Is it a little cold during this scene? It was. This was uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we had our first black ice uh, freezing rain storm. Uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, we had a, an accident. Um, we had to use uh, uh, lights to uh, document that accident. Um, oh. Excuse me, Chris. Um, so we use the lights to document that scene. We use two uh, Nomad 360 lights. Um, by the time that we were done, those lights were so frozen that I had to basically shut them off, put them in my Suburban. I could not break them down because they had so much ice on them that I had to take them into my, uh, into my shop and we had to let them thaw out before we could start breaking them down. <laughs> but they're still Good. running. You they were still turn running. Back on. Yep. All right. Yep. They were still running. Still there you running. go. Uh, the the temperature that night was uh, was minus five or minus ten degrees that night. Oof. All right. So, and yep. uh, approximately how long were they running on that? Uh, we ran them. Um, we ran them on on full power. Uh, both lights were on yellow and we were over four hours on those. All right. Good. So they ran excellent. Nice. So yeah, because once you get into colder, um, uh, temperatures, that's going to affect the batteries. Um, that was always a, uh, 
a handcuff of or a hamstring of uh, photography and cameras or batteries and cameras that once the temperature plummets, your camera dies after like half an hour because the batteries die. Um, so, so it's good to hear that the these batteries are holding up in the cold conditions and obviously when it's wet, frozen, you know, just thaw them out, let them dry out, and they're good to go for the next round. I want to add just a couple more things on, on that particular scene. Um, those lights were in my Suburban 2 for several weeks in minus degree weather. So when that call came out and they wanted these lights, you know, to help assist on this uh, investigation, I was sweating a little bit because I'm sitting here going, man, these lights were, these lights were in my Suburban. We were getting nights of minus 20 uh, for, you know, almost five days where it was minus 10, minus 15 out uh, at night. And I'm sitting here going, man, they want these lights. And I left these lights in my truck. Like, there's no way. There's absolutely no way that these lights are even going to stay on. And uh, so I got there. I popped them on. And I even told the deputy, I said, man, these lights, I haven't charged these lights. I said, these lights have, have been in my truck for almost two weeks in this cold environment. I, there's no way. I said, we might get an hour, hour and a half. We're going to have to get a generator out here so we can, you know, power them. It didn't even phase him, Chris. I was completely blown away by by how these lights stayed on with with them not being charged for two weeks, staying in my vehicle for two weeks in this in the cold, and then coming out and and being uh, in this element for those for that many hours, and they just they rocked it. They rocked it. I was completely blown away. Nice. That's impressive. It's it's cool to hear things like that because uh, uh, you know we're. Our offices are in Southern California. Uh, we don't deal with a lot of cold. We're always trying to, to hear about how the lights perform in the coldest, nastiest conditions. So it's good to hear that, that uh, testimonial that, you know, that's about as crappy as it gets when you have negative 15, you have snow, you have, you know, frozen splash from roads and all that kind of stuff. That's cool to hear. Very cool. Ah, so it looks like it's a little warmer here, but you still, unfortunately, are dealing with a nasty scene out on a rural roadway. Uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about this one. So, you know, this was an accident that uh, this this uh, this agency needed a little bit of help uh, mapping this. So uh, I was called in to uh, assist a little bit on uh, mapping. Uh, we brought uh, four Nomad 360s on this, and uh, then we also brought a Prime. Uh, the biggest thing that I wanted to share with this, and, and, and we got permission to share uh, uh, these uh, two, two uh, files, uh, was the fact that the thing that I love to share with uh, agencies when they want to start mapping, when they want to start mapping uh, at night, is the fact that it takes a minimum of four lights. And when you look at these, when you look at this scene, I want you guys to notice the nice ring of light around that scene. And how I explain that to people is the Nomad 360 lights, the Fox Fury lights go eight foot and they come down. And how I explain that, the best way for me to explain that is when you go to a photographer or when you go get your family pictures done, you sit down and you have that photographer put those lights above you and they come down on you, okay? You don't take a light and you don't shoot it right at your family. You have lights that come up and they shoot down on you. And that's exactly what Fox Fairy lights do is they go up and we're sort of casting that light over, uh, over this scene a little bit. And if you look at these two photos, you can see that nice ring of light completely around that scene. And, and that's the biggest point that we have to try to get people to understand when they want to map accidents at night is to get a nice ring of light around that scene that you're trying to collect. And for some context, um, obviously you were taking these photos from a drone. You were mapping this scene from a drone. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mapping the scene from a drone. Yes. Okay. And so, say, without these lights, and you were telling me yesterday that when you came up on the scene, what they were, kind of what they were using, <laughs> uh, we got, can you elaborate yeah. a little bit on what, what, where they were before you showed up? 
when I got on the scene, they were still doing a little bit of extrication and they did not have probably enough lighting to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, they, they didn't have enough lighting to, to, uh, to, uh, they had, they had the lighting that they had, let's just say that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and the additional lighting that Fox Fury provided for them, uh, made their job, uh, you know, that made their stressful job on this scene a little bit better. What's to say that? Yeah. Um, and also, um, so the way that you have lights of, you know, set out in an array, this is, and these are great, great photos to, to illustrate this. Um, you, you have this even halo of light around the scene so that you don't have deep shadows um, that would be problematic with, say, the mapping software. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? You don't have to go into detail about the software, but just the importance of being able to have that, um, you know, even illumination of the scene and for uh, documentation and mapping. Yeah, because when you start having shadows or, or, or the other thing is, 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 you know, when we, when we teach or when we train, uh, you know, on how to set up your lighting for documentation, for mapping at night, we always train to take your drone and fly over it and to take a look at your scene. And because if those lights are too close, your scene's going to look blown out. It'd be like, you know, flashing something. You're not going to see the detail. So say that, you know, the light on, you know, on the, on the, on, on your left picture, that light on the corner of that band, if that light was too close, we wouldn't see the detail on that band. It would just look like a big blown out white you know, blur and from the drone. So what we always train is to take your drone, fly over that scene and, and adjust your lights out. Okay. Or, you know, tone your lights down. All these lights, believe it or not, Chris, we're at medium range, but mm -hmm. I wasn't even on full power range on these lights mm -hmm. right now. So, you know, they were on medium range and, uh, you know, we just back those lights up. I set these lights uh, in that road ditch um, back. I set them twice. You know, I had the drone hovering. I walked out there. We set those lights back a little bit. And uh, that's how you set your lights. So, yeah, and it's interesting in a few of the different scenarios that I've been part of. Uh, it's the natural instinct is turn those things on high and get them, you know, as powerful as possible. And then you find out that. Um, especially the kind of a island of light scenario that you have here where the, the, all the surrounding area is dark. Um, it does make some sense to bring those lights down and you don't have as much light pounding on the scene. Added benefit there is that the lights will last longer too. So if it is a fatal situation like this, you might be out there for, you know, say five, six, 12 hours, depending on the scene. Um, so you have the ability to run those lights longer. Um, so yes, there's one, yeah, this, there's is, one. this is a very good, um, really good, um, illustration here of, uh, being able to light up a scene for mapping. There's one other thing that I wanted to touch base with on this. And I want our, our viewers, uh, or the people that are watching right now, because the next clip that you're going to go to is going to share, shed some light on something else. But the one thing that I want everyone to be looking at these two photos is look at the color consistency of the Fox Fairy lighting. So please keep that in mind. So when we go to the next clip, we're going to touch base on that a little bit. Okay. It's nice, white, crisp light around this whole scene. And for document or for evidence documentation, for mapping, for everything, that is so crucial when, when, you're, when you're trying to collect evidence through a camera, through mapping, through a drone, is is that that is so crucial on that enough said <laughs> so this is a um this is a screen grab from a um one of your maps and um uh, go ahead and talk about the different lights used in this this scenario so you know we were doing this for some training uh i was training one of our uh uh, local pilots here in another county on on some mapping and on some some uh, Fox Fury. He, uh, their county bought some Fox Fury uh, lighting. Uh, they wanted to do some training, so this was a training that we set up. 
And uh, we wanted to show the difference between the Fox Fury lighting compared to um, some of the, the, the tool uh, shop uh, lighting. And um, obviously you could tell the difference between the Fox Fury, nice white crisp lighting. And then we get down to that five o'clock, four o'clock, three o'clock position. And we start to see a little bit different color contrast. Um, and believe it or not, it actually takes two of those lights um, to equal one of the Fox Fury lights. And, uh, and then obviously you can see the color contrast too. The other thing that you'll notice is those lights aren't, they don't go up as high. So those lights actually have to come in a little closer. And when you start to take uh, the photos and you start to look at this map, we start to get some goofy shadows also. So. Yeah, and this uh, kind of brings up a, a point that um, a lot of times our eyes are incredible, incredible things. Um, we don't see as much of the color difference. We're like, oh, light is light or it looks good. And when you start working with cameras, camera sensors, uh, they're much more sensitive or they're much less sensitive, but they can't render colors the same and they'll really show a difference in color where our eyes might see everything looking the same, that camera will really bring that out. And you don't notice it until all of a sudden you start bringing, uh, putting it into a, a mapping software or you're looking at photos and things that may have looked red all of a sudden start looking orange. And those little differences could be the difference in, um, you know, making mistakes or being thrown out in court. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, and there was one other little thing that we have on here is that, um, you know, we talked about the, the lights. Um, if they're too close, they blow out and you won't have any detail. The opposite is if you have shadows that a mapping software, if it can't see that detail, it's going to just say there's nothing there. And so it'll be a void. So if you have these shadows in between the cars, um, or inside the car or, you know, wherever, um, it, it'll just not put anything on the map. So that can be a problem too, because then if it doesn't see it and there was a piece of evidence like hairs or something on there, but the mapping software didn't see that, then it's not there. So that's another yeah. reason why the placement of lights in a nice equal format can be, is, been, is necessary to get a nice even uh, representation for the mapping. Yep, yep. Uh, this particular map, we tried some different stuff too. And from uh, Mario's uh, uh, suggestion, what we did was we stuck Rugo lighting uh, between the front seat and the back seats of both these vehicles to eliminate the shadows from inside the vehicles. Oh. So when we did the mapping of this, uh, it worked out tremendously. Uh, so now we don't have those dark shadows inside these vehicles. It, it illuminated the inside of those vehicles when we did the mapping. So it was, a, cool. it was an awesome suggestion for Mario. So yeah. Uh, so that that we started doing now. So we just pop a couple of Rugos between the front seat, back seat. And so when we're doing the mapping now, uh, it gives us more detail of, of, of that vehicle when we're when we're doing the mapping. So it's a great idea. Yeah, because that's one of those things that you always have, like the, the carcass of the car vehicle is always shows, but then it's just nothing on the inside. And yeah. you're, you're missing out on a lot of information there. Very cool. Yep. Yep. Ah, the Exodoc. You want to talk a little bit about your experience with this and how this can apply to an accident scene? Yeah, the Exodoc is a is a cool thing that that Mario came up with. It's it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, you know, so you get done flying uh, a scene uh, with with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the drone. Um, let me grab let me grab mine here real quick, Chris. So you get done flying a scene. What you can do now is you got a handheld camera uh, that you can walk around and you can take photos of that scene now, uh, thermal. Uh, what we've come up with is if you wanted to walk into a fire scene or an accident scene, you can actually uh, use this for, uh, for a thermal imaging camera or a regular camera. 
And with uh, with some of the photogrammetry mapping softwares out there, uh, you can actually try to do some stitching with this thing and, and include it in their photogrammetry software. The other cool thing that we could do with this thing, especially with the Evo uh, series, is we have that amazing thing called the Live Deck. <clears throat> our uh, Nomad 360 lights, our uh, transformers, they all have this quarter 20 screw on top of it. So if you look on the bottom of this, it does have a quarter 20. So what we've been doing is we can mount this on top of one of our lights and uh, we can be live streaming uh, just this thing sitting on top of the light. And uh, it, it works out really, really good. So say that we get done uh, at a fire scene, we get done flying, we're now in the investigation side of it. Uh, the guys are wrapping up, they're streaming that stuff, you know, back to the station, but they still want to keep an eye, you know, on the investigation side of it. We could set this guy up at, at you know, on top of a Nomad 360 light. We could carry it inside with the live deck and with an AMV box or whatever box that we're using to stream. Um, now we can, now they have access or they have, they, they could be watching us inside. So with this thing just perched on top of a Nomad 360 uh, light, it just can just sit here and just be an additional camera uh, as it's watching us work. So. Yeah, and it's interesting that you have, you mentioned the thermal, and that's something I hadn't really thought about before, but, you know, your drone is this amazing thermal camera. Um, uh, your department agency probably paid a lot of money for that thermal camera. So the ability to get the most out of that and not just use it flying in the air, but also use it on the ground, use a station for a, like a thermal overwatch, um, that adds a lot of value to the tools that you already have. The one cool thing about the ExoDoc station that we have a couple customers that are doing is, is uh, there's an additional plate uh, that I got in my hand. Uh, has four uh, mounting screws to it, and then it has an additional piece on the bottom. Um, they're mounting this thing in their vehicle. Uh, it will slide in there. And so what they're doing is they already have that thing all set up. It's stationary in their vehicle. They get to a scene, all they got to do is just pull that out and their drone is ready to go. Yeah. And those so. those uh, seconds or minutes are critical when you're trying to rig up a drone and get everything going. If you can just grab and go and boom, you're up on a fire scene or a crime scene, that can make the difference. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So, yeah, that's a, that's a cool uh, new product that we've brought out uh, this year. And um, it works well with the Exo Lander system uh, that fits on multiple drones. Uh, so yeah, that, that was, that was a, a unique uh, tool to use for um, a investigation situation uh, that may, brings value to your other tools you're already using. Yeah. Uh, so here, here's a shot that um, this is one that I personally really love because it is such a good example of one of the um, problems that fire agencies have in that um, money gets invested on the scene lights of the truck and we put a lot of money into that, but then there's no um, investment in portable lighting and it doesn't get used. And this scenario shows the trucks on the street, but the actual fire is in the back of the house where it's completely dark. Um, so if you are flying the drone, which this is a capture from the drone, um, you're not getting any information from the drone because there's no lighting from back there and there's other solutions for that. Um, but also like on the backside, there's no, um, you know, there could be dangers back there. There's like a pool, there could be debris, fences, uh so it's you know more dangerous for firefighters as well so uh there are uh, solutions we have solutions for that but i think that this is just a great photo to, to show that scenario and the problem that we have with that uh aaron you have any thoughts on that no <clears throat> it happens all the time you know it happens in our rural uh community you know in our rural uh districts uh, you, you just can't get back there. You know, we have a, you know, we get called out to a chimney fire, uh, 
late at night, early in the morning, we get there. Uh, we're trying to get water flowing. We're trying to get drop tanks going. Um, and guess what? We have hardly no light back there. We have hardly no light back there. So it happens all the time. So. So this happens to be the same exact scene. Um, and Aaron did have light on the scene. Um, so um, talk a little bit about the tools that you're using here to light up this, this scene here. So, you know, the first thing that we did was, you know, we obviously put the thermal camera up and, you know, we, we, we found hot spots on that roof. Um, so then, you know, we needed to get firefighters up on that roof to do some venting and our newest Lieutenant, uh, looked at me and basically, you know, we both came to the conclusion that, Hey, you got the light. You know, you got the big light for your on your drone. I said, "Yep," and he goes, "Let's put the let's let's get the light up there because you know they're getting they're getting getting ready to go up there and, and bent that roof." And uh, so while I was doing that, I also grabbed a uh, Nomad 360 to put in the back, and that's these two lights. You know, that's these two pictures right here. Um, so we have a Nomad uh, 360 that's shining us some light in the back, and then we have a uh, uh, Evo two with the exolander with the d100 light that's shining on the roof so if you go to nice. the next clip there um you can see that with those guys working on the roof obviously as fire guys want to see the thermal imaging of it but we also got to remember the firefighters that are up there on that roof trying to do their job and if you would take that light away there's no hardly no light up there you know they have their helmet lights but you give them a nice bright light up there, uh, it takes the stress away already into a stressful, you know, situation. Uh, they can see what's going on. Um, you know, their little helmet lights, it's light, but nothing compared to a D100 light up there, lighting up that whole roof, so. And just for clarification that this is the same photo both in the top left and the bottom right. The top left just has a thermal overlaying the over top of the visible so the benefit here is that you could have that live deck and be seeing that thermal back at the truck or wherever but at the same time you're using that light and it's lighting up for your guys on the roof and also yep. you could be switching back between thermal and rgb or visible camera to to see what exactly is happening so yep. there's a lot of tools here that are working together um, to benefit a lot of different people in different places. It's pretty yep. cool. Yep, that light is not gonna affect your thermal. The other thing that that light's gonna do is it's not gonna drain your battery of your drone down because it's a secondary battery source. It has its own batteries. Mm -hmm. So it's not gonna affect your battery. It was cold that night. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things is, is yeah, we have that, you know, we have that spotlight that goes on top, but you're, you're, you're feeding off the battery source where this D100 is a completely different battery source. So you have your full battery power because it has its own battery source. Uh, just for reference, how, how high were you from the roof? What's your distance here on the camera? uh if i remember right i think i was roughly about uh 65 feet here okay so plenty of working room oh yeah um, yeah it's not like you're on top of there and causing danger to them or getting in the way no cool nope nice so now um our last little segment we're going to transition to looking at like thinking about a tactical um, aspect of how you could use lighting for both tactical and for investigation. Uh, thoughts on this, Aaron? Hey, you know, the Nomad 360s, the Nomad Nows uh, work great for tactical. So you say that you got someone, you know, in that house, you don't want them seeing you. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to start setting up those Nomad 360 lights and they're going to provide a light curtain. They're going to blind the subject or the, you know, the subject that's located in that house. And the thing that you got to remember is we have two, uh, we have two versions of that Nomad Now. We have a single activation. We have a multi-activation of that Nomad Now. And, what, and we have a lot of questions uh, when they're ordering the Nomad Now. 
Single activation means the remote, you know, only activates the one that you get. The multi means is if you set multiple nomad nows around that house, that remote triggers all of them to turn on at one time. So um, if you have several nomad nows around that house and you guys are getting ready to breach that house or something, you hit your trigger, everything turns on, off you go. The cool thing about this is you set up your light curtain, you guys do your thing, you breach the home, you guys get your subject out of your house, everything is, you know, ends friendly, hopefully. Now you can take those lights and you can take those lights and you can bring them into your investigation part of it. If you need to break those lights down and start to tone those lights down, you can start to use those lights, you know, and, and start to collect your evidence using your lights as secondary light sources for your camera work, for your mapping. If you're going to map with your drone, you can take those lights inside your house and start to document your house. If you cut the power already, you can do that type of stuff. Yeah, so that uh, talks to a little bit about the kind of the value of these tools for the agency in that it's not just a single purpose tool. You know, if the SWAT team uses that for that light wall, wall of light or curtain, that's great. And then they get a call, they got to go somewhere else. That tool can continue to be used for the investigation. Um, and so your agency's dollars get stretched out a lot further with this tool. And it's not like you have to buy one set for here, or one set for there, well, depending on your how you're set up. But there's a lot of versatility in these lights and they can be used for a lot of different things. Yep. So. Yep. But um, yeah, and this, I, I think this was a, uh, as a, a fire investigation, but the same thing. I mean, this could be a meth lab that blew up, you know, and that's what they were dealing with on the outside. And now here you go, you turn around and you've got the tools that have good solid light to uh, investigate that on the inside. Um, here's a, uh, here's a photo that, uh, Chesterfield Police Department in Virginia uh, sent us recently. And uh, this is a great example of how uh, you're using the scene lights for lighting up an apartment building. Um, you know, if they've got an operation, they're lighting up all sides. They can see you know, the best they can in the windows, um, see if anyone runs off in the, in the woods behind there, what have you. Um, again, if these guys have to take off, those lights can stay there if there's an investigation afterwards. Um, it's good, solid white light. Uh, this is a really good example of um, what Aaron was talking about before with that lamp post that is right in the middle of the scene. You know, we have these in all of our parking lots and our uh, buildings and all this stuff. It's like a sodium, uh, puts off that ugly yellow green light. But if you're trying to investigate a scene and that's what you're using, your colors are going to look horrible. Um, it's not, I mean, it's going to provide you light right underneath the light post, but if you get further away, there's less light. So that's where, you know, having these tools around a scene is going to make both the tactical team's jobs easier because they're going to be able to, to see their subjects easier and also the investigation team uh, with uh, being able to move the lights where they need them, have good, clean, accurate light, um, and it's very versatile and they'll last them throughout the night if they need so. So Aaron, any other thoughts on that? No, no, it's, 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 it's a great tool, uh, for, for setting up that, that light curtain, you know, it protects our, our, uh, our law enforcement agencies, you know, so anything that, that anything that we can do to protect those guys, uh, it's, 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 it's a good tool. So nice. Cool. Well, I think um, you know, we covered a lot. Uh, there was a couple questions um, that uh, was asked about, you know, working the, the uh, lights in the rain. And yep, ab absolutely. Everything is rated at IPX7, completely waterproof. Um, also on the investigation side, uh, we didn't talk about it, but, you know, if you have a meth lab that blew up um, and you have to use your lights in there, Afterwards, you can take these lights and decontaminate them so that you can get any um, chemicals or harmful bio um, 
material that's on them, you can get that off of there and easily clean them. That's not going to damage them. So that's that's a that's a big thing on the investigation side, uh, especially when you're you know if, like you're talking about uh, tight spaces, putting that in, you're like crawling in a crawl space and it's wet. There's water. You don't know what that water is, but you can put the now in there. You can do your job and then clean that thing off afterwards. So that's that's a big aspect of it. So. Um, and one last thing that I wanted to um, see if, it, if there's any questions, if anyone wants to post any questions, go ahead and do that in the, the chat or the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to give the, um, wanted to talk real quickly about our forensic book, which is something we put together about a couple years ago. And uh, it's aimed at forensic investigators, but anyone doing investigation, uh, anyone using cameras, photography for your work, uh, this is a really good guide to talk about um, photography, lighting, lighting for forensics. Uh, then we go in and we, we started building a database of different samples with biological uh, samples. Uh, and how they render with different alternative light sources. So if you're on the forensic side, you'll geek out on that stuff. Uh, if you're just on the, say, other side of the investigation, you may find some of the photography and lighting um, resources to be useful as well. So uh, we wanted to invite you to sign up for that. And down, you can download this book and it's a great resource to learn about some of the topics that we were uh, talking about here today in this webinar. And then uh, it's in our um, on our website. If you go to our forensic um, uh, section, there's a, a uh, download spot there. So please uh, please download that, and we welcome you to uh, learn from that. So uh, with that, um, Aaron, any any last thoughts on? I, I don't. Um, right. I I can tell you that I haven't destroyed any of these lights, so. And I've tried, <laughs> so uh, so no. These lights are very durable. Uh, we we ran into situations where you know we let rain. You know they they've sat in the rain. Uh, they've sat you know in in a in a structure where you know they were being you know uh, hosed on and stuff like that. These these lights are pretty uh, durable. So nice. Well, I want to offer that um, if anyone on here is uh, interested in getting a demo, uh, you want to learn more um, and talk to Aaron about, um, you know, the both lighting or how he's using the lighting with the different technologies or some of his experience in fire investigation, um, please reach out. We'd be uh, We'd be excited to uh, have you connect with Aaron and who knows, he's traveling all over the US all the time, doing trainings, doing demos, all that. So we can set you up with a demo uh, or training or what have you. So uh, we did have a question that just popped in. Uh, how can I download the video of the presentation to share with my customers? Um, I will. We will be sending out a link after this. So, um, uh, look for that. I will try to get to that today. There's a chance it may be tomorrow morning, but either way, we'll definitely send out a link and you can share that. Uh, we want to share that with, with your customers. So, uh, and I think that about wraps it up. I want to thank everybody for attending today and um, we appreciate this and we'll be, uh, we'll be putting together another webinar next month. And we don't know what the topic is yet, but we'll know here in the next few days. So uh, we hope that you join us on the next round. And I want to thank Aaron again for uh, all your knowledge and spending some time with us to uh, go through all this stuff. Thanks, guys. Have awesome. a good one. All right. Thank you all. And we'll see you on the next round.